system. We're bumping 570 meters at the moment, which is a world record for a building site. It's a very aggressive environment within the pipe with the high pressures, the aggregates uh, rubbing against the steel. Uh, you, you've got to watch out because you can wear through the steel and the pipes first. It takes 40 minutes for the concrete to travel up the pipes from the bottom to the 155th floor. It's a combined effort of raw machine power and subtle chemistry. If the concrete is too thin and set slowly, it causes delays. If it's too thick, it may set too soon and block the pipes. That night, it takes until 4 a.m. before the job is finished. Now the concrete and steel skeleton of the Bourge Dubai is nearly complete. On a mammoth project that will cost about $1 billion to build, every day is precious. But the system has worked to perfection. The tower is nearly 600 meters tall, and a new floor goes on every three days. Prefabrication technology allowed giant skyscrapers to grow ever faster, which made them even more profitable and desirable. But as skyscrapers soared ever higher into the clouds, they became exposed to a new enemy, one that exploited every weakness, the wind. To build the 442-meter Sears Tower in Chicago, the proverbial windy city, Engineers had to turn the skyscraper inside out. In 1970, the architects building the new headquarters for Sears and Roebuck in Chicago faced a problem. Their skyscraper, the Sears Tower, would be over a hundred floors tall, a height that exposed it to huge wind forces. Building this skyscraper using a traditional steel skeleton would have caused massive problems. The taller a steel skeleton gets, the more susceptible it is to bending in high winds. Gusts off Lake Michigan could buffet a skyscraper at up to 80 kilometers an hour. This would cause the upper floors to sway, affecting the workers inside. The motion of a tall building is more like the motion of a ship creates a kind of seasickness. There's that same sense in a, in a very tall building. So it's necessary to reduce the swaying component down so that people are not sick. The architects of the Sears Tower invented a technology that could beat the wind. They shifted the steel framework from the inside of the building to the outside. This so-called exoskeleton made it very hard for wind to bend the building. In the Sears Tower, nine such tubes locked together to make the building rock solid. The exoskeleton was the best way of resisting wind ever invented. Even at wind speeds of over 90 kilometers per hour, the top floor of the Sears Tower only moves 15 centimeters. The Burj Dubai is expected to be nearly twice as tall as the Sears Tower. At this extreme height, fighting the wind with a rigid exoskeleton is not good enough. To stop the high caliber residents from getting seasick, the architects turned to highly advanced aerodynamics. The most important thing in a tall building is the way it interacts with the wind. And so uh, what we did is we essentially, as we designed this building, we kept testing in the wind tunnel. And we, and we used the wind tunnel as part of our design process. At high speeds, wind can be extremely dangerous for a skyscraper. Air rushes around the building and forms mini tornadoes called vortices. 
These areas of low pressure suck the building sideways, and the taller the building, the more dangerous the vortices become. And these large forces are actually perpendicular to the direction of the wind. If a tall building were ever to, get to fall down the wind, it's most likely it'd fall down sideways to the wind, not in the direction of the wind. So on the Burj Dubai, rather than fight the wind, Bill and the design team decide to deceive it. They don't make the tower flat and rectangular, but give the Burj Dubai a more unpredictable shape. Each section of the tower is designed to deflect the wind in a different way. This disrupts the power of the vortices and breaks the hold of the wind on the building. When we design the building, we're actually designing the wind and the way the, the wind behaves uh, around the building. And it, and it makes a tremendous uh, difference. We would never have been able to go this tall if we had not done that. With mobility, gravity, heat, and wind conquered, the skyscraper faced its next big challenge. In Asia, where booming economies wanted to show off their wealth, super tall skyscrapers became the objects of desire. But Asia is rife with the nemesis of tall buildings, earthquakes. To make the 509 meter Taipei 101 possible, skyscrapers had to take another leap forward. In 1999, the architects of the world's tallest skyscraper, the Taipei 101 in Taiwan, faced a problem. Taipei sits near the Pacific Ring of Fire, the most seismically active area on Earth. An earthquake hits the city roughly twice a year. It was not a question of if, but when the Earth would shake the Taipei 101. Earthquakes are actually really strong compared to wind. Uh, for example, wind loading very rarely will break a large building, but for an earthquake it's actually quite easy to do that. Adam Crew will test a model building on an earthquake simulator. To make it realistic, this model is built with spaghetti. Spaghetti and steel are actually quite similar in the way they behave. Uh, you can actually see that it, it buckles quite nicely. It's a relatively low load, and steel beams behave in a very, very similar way. So it models steel really quite well. With the top floor glued in place, the model is ready to face the tremors. Here comes the slowest, the first earthquake. You can see the building really isn't moving very much at all, looks pretty solid. So not really uh, being bothered by this earthquake. There's a bit of a faster earthquake now. Again, a little bit of movement, but the building looks really nice and strong. Even faster. And, oh, and it's gonna go, it looks like the building. If that had been a real building, the four would have fallen down and all the people would have been killed. So although it looks relatively intact, uh, this is really a catastrophic failure for a building. Adam Crew tests a second model that has elastic bands added to the spaghetti. So here comes the earthquake that smashed the other building. See how well this one does. And you can see it's, it's moving a lot, but it's actually performing really well. The top of the building is actually hardly moving at all. Uh, it's literally staying there stationary, and the ground is moving really quite violently underneath it. So slightly bizarrely, by making the building more flexible, you've made the building stronger. To survive in fast and violent quakes, the Taipei 101 needed a dash of elasticity. The building rigid where it had to be, but flexible where it could afford to be. 